but you know, when we started doing Rain Summit uh, so many years ago, uh, online radio was really an at work desktop PC based phenomenon. That was the the early days of the industry for everyone, and still is for some of us. But for most uh, webcasters right now, mobile is where it's at, thanks to the proliferation and ubiquity of smart smartphones, as we talked about earlier, uh, tablets, in-car listening, and soon maybe even via your watch. So here to moderate a great lineup of speakers on that topic is one of my favorite moderators. And let's bring the whole panel up on stage uh, to expert in the area to moderate, the general manager of Jacobs Media, Paul Jacobs. All right, we're going to finish with a bang, I hope. Uh, before I start, it, it, was, it was great seeing Joel Salkowitz uh, on that uh, previous panel. A little known fact about Joel, he was probably our third or fourth app client back in 2008 uh, when Pulse uh, was still on the air. And it's interesting that here we are the day that Apple had a huge announcement because at the very first Apple Worldwide Developers Conference, <laughs> that, the following June in 2009, uh, uh, Steve Jobs played a video of people around the world holding up their smartphones, like in front of the pyramids, uh, yeah, I mean, all around the Great Wall. And in the middle of this video, in what we called the 90, or the, the 0.9 second orgasm, uh, somebody stood up in Times Square and held up the Pulse app. And it was the first radio app ever featured uh, at the Apple Worldwide <laughs> Developer Conference. So that, that's how visionary Joel is and how lucky we were. Um, to close out rain, uh, we sat down as a group of panelists and said, well, you know, we could talk about our companies. <laughs> you know, we could do a lot of show and tell. We could talk about the state of mobile today. But you kind of all know all of that. So what we, we've really decided to do is if mobile is the new black, which was the name they came up with uh, for our panel, uh, we're, we're just going to assume it goes with everything. And we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about where it is going. Uh, from each of the panelists' uh, perspectives. So I'd like to just lead off with some comments, and, th and then we're going to dive right in. Uh, we've been involved with mobile uh, from the beginning, again, 2008. It feels to us, and I'm going to be a little provocative and a little tweaky negative here, it feels to us like mobile for radio has flatlined. Um, it's great. I mean, you know, the radio industry, I believe, has done a great job diving into mobile. Uh, some companies, uh, I believe, have done a phenomenal job. Uh, but it's fairly ubiquitous at this point. But this is a space that is constantly moving, constantly morphing. And I think it's really important that when we look at apps for radio stations, too many of them look today in the way they looked three or four years ago. They haven't been updated. <laughs> they uh, have the same kind of features and functionality. And in order to be truly competitive, you know, we've seen all these studies lately uh, about apps, about uh, consumers who only activate three or four or five apps a week or, or a month, you know, it's really important that radio leverage its daily uniqueness into mobile. And, and we hope that in the next phase of mobile, this happens more often. We work with over 300 radio stations, big and small, so we're fairly attuned to what broadcasters are thinking. And it is a mixed bag. So what I'd like to do is kind of lay out a bit of a critical assessment of where we are in order to hopefully set the stage for where we believe mobile for radio needs to go. First of all, stations and companies need to allocate more budget for mobile. And I'm not saying that as a mobile app developer trying to upsell you. Uh, we, we have clients balk at 1500 bucks an app. Yeah, and you're up against companies uh, that you've seen up here on the stage today that have invested millions of dollars <laughs> Uh, in, into their mobile experience, and they're constantly changing and updating. There needs to be R&D. There's very little innovation happening. And you know what? Us as developers are as guilty uh, as anybody, but we need to move quicker as an industry. There's a bit of a set it and forget it mentality. For many, simply having an app is good enough, and then they move on to the next bright, shiny object. And if you're going to be in the mobile space, it is fluid, and you need to be on top of it. Too many look at mobile as just another transmitter. Okay, so we're broadcasting there now. That's great. And we feel that for radio, 
mobile has so much unlimited potential, not just for audience engagement, for revenue we're going to talk about, um, that you know, we, we feel that radio could take better advantage as we move forward. Radio needs better currency for mobile. Uh, our rating system and our ability to monetize the, the traffic that we have in mobile and then combine it with all the other activity we have, whether it's online streaming, over-the-air listening, <laughs> uh, our, our inability at this point in time to combine the two is really hurting our industry and really holding us back as an industry uh, to maximize the mobile opportunity. Uh, as a result, we run into a lot of program directors who don't enthusiastically promote their app. Why would I send listeners to mobile if I can't monetize it? So, you know, what are we waiting for here? You know, the audience is moving that way. You know, our metrics need to catch up with the rest of us. And then the result is, structurally, I walk into all these radio stations, and a lot of them look the same today as they looked 10 years ago. And in mobile, we're taking a bit of a radio approach. We're selling spots. We're, we're selling banners, very low CPM type platforms. And mobile is this unvarnished, wide open revenue opportunity for radio because our industry has the one thing that we know the pure plays now, and that's cum and credibility and outstanding brands. Because again, we don't just compete with other radio stations. We do compete with Yelp. We compete with Waze. We, we are in the traffic business. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that our mobile strategies are as great there um, as these competitors are. So we need to update those services. Um, you might have seen a study that came out a few months ago that was really stunning. It costs an app provider $1.31 on Android and $1.28 in Apple per download. In radio, it's free. Okay, all we need to do is port our listeners over by providing a great mobile experience. So we have a great opportunity as an industry to invest more, to pay more attention, to think more strategically, to not just think of it as an extension of our radio station, but an ability to take our brand and apply it to this important mobile space that we think is a big part of the future. But fortunately, I'm not the only person you're going to hear from today. We, we have a, a pretty fascinating collection of really smart people here coming at this from a variety of perspectives. So what I'd like to do is introduce them uh, individually. Uh, and as I introduce you, then you know, share with us your thoughts, and then we'll go through the panel. But we're open for questions. It's late in the day. If you have questions, let's uh, shake it up a little bit and go for it. So we're going to start with Deborah Sayan. Uh, Deborah's going to provide us with an industry overview based on what Marketron is seeing based on their work with hundreds of radio stations. They have a unique insight into what broadcasters are thinking, what they're asking about, and where Marketron wants to take them. Uh, Deborah's the chief revenue officer for Marketron. She oversees North American sales and business development for all three of Marketron's product lines, revenue management and traffic solutions, mobile marketing, and interactive. She's managed radio stations and sales teams, uh, so she understands the station side as well as what she's doing now. And she's just really a great presenter. So <laughs> no pressure. So no, no pressure. No pressure. So Deborah, <laughs> okay. share with us your vision. Sure, thanks. And I'll, I'll start by just saying at Marketron, we look at mobile very broadly. We would define this a number of different ways. So I'll kind of set the stage because then we have a lot of specialists on this panel who will dive deeper into some of these topics. So let me just define them. And as I define them, I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the monetization side because, you know, at heart, at Marketron, we have really two main purposes, is to help with revenue management solutions and audience engagement. Mobile really falls in both categories. So the first thing is, uh, of, uh, I'll start with three. Streaming and apps, of course, and we're going to talk about that a lot in the panel, so I'm not really going to address it at all. I'll let my esteemed colleagues go there. Um, there's two forms of mobile in terms of mobile websites. There's the station website, which hopefully is mobile optimized. Uh, there's a statistic uh, that one of my colleagues, Martin, who's here, uh, who heads up our mobile division, will tell you that close to 70% of people will leave a website if it's not mobile optimized because the experience is so awful 
They just don't want to mess with the tiny screen and all the little tabs and things like that. And there's always an option to go to the full website, but mobile websites and the inventory they carry is an opportunity. And then there's what I call mobile websites for clients. There are lots of radio stations who've chosen to create mobile optimized websites using perhaps a software package uh, that allows for that, a white label uh, software package that allows for that. And they'll sell that as a service to their mom and pop advertisers who really have no idea how to get a mobile we optimized website. That is a source of revenue for them. So there's the inventory on a mobile website, and then there's actually the reselling of mobile optimized websites to advertisers. That may not be a strategy for every station group, but some of them are, are doing that. So in that category, uh, I meet monthly for 30 minutes with the top digital superstars at many uh, who across our client base in both Canada and the US. And we did like a three part series in which we studied what are all the different forms of mobile inventory that are out there. We kind of actually defined it for ourselves. So certainly we went to the IAB and, and got their input, but we also defined it. And one of the things that I found is that, that the technology, of course, is a little bit of ahead of the business model. A lot of them are out there trying to sell to their advertisers locally and finding that the advertiser doesn't know how to value that space. They're not really sure what they're getting from it, right? So we might be a little bit ahead of the game, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be there because by the time the game gets to you, you're behind, right? So don't be afraid of that. That's okay. And you know, these things aren't that costly to begin with. They really aren't. So this 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 is a fake thing that these things are so expensive because they're not. So those are three parts of, of mobile. Then there's the whole concept of mobile gaming. Um, like for instance, we have a scratch and win game that a lot of our clients resell and make part of really fun, engaging advertiser campaigns, which is which is uh, a good thing. And then there is uh, local-based advertising, which uh, again is become a very, very big idea where people are actually selling the ability to send hyper-targeted messages to people with a certain interest level based on their location and reselling those packages. That's another form of, uh, of inventory. So you have a number of different types of inventory and ways you define mobile, right? So that's firstly how we look at it from a broad uh, perspective, I guess. And then of course there's texting, which you know, we thought that over time, maybe texting wouldn't be as popular. It's more popular than it ever has been. And the monetization of texting is really very simple versus monetizing other digital assets. So we're seeing people doing very well with text uh, sponsorships and monetization, and also gaming with the texting tools, contesting, lots of fun ways. And of course, there's direct response. Marrying the direct response with the on-air ad, there's a lot of power in that, that combination. So we teach how to do that. Uh, so that's what we're kind of seeing on the on the broad scale. Where I really think we get hung up on the on the monetization side is education of the sellers who are actually out there talking about it. If they're uncomfortable with it, they won't sell it. So we actually do. Uh, we think it's really important that people feel comfortable talking about it before they go out there and try to sell it. I do think that. Mobile monetization isn't where it needs to be, but it's certainly somewhere. So I think you just have to keep trying and get good at it. And that's what we're seeing. Great, thank you. And, uh, any questions for Deborah? What she said, or we just want to keep rolling. Yeah, uh, one thing I should point out, I see Tim Murphy sitting in the back, and you know, when I was talking about um, the competition that radio faces from outside of radio, uh, Tim oversees Entercom uh, Digital. Tim was the first and, and very rare client who contacted us early on, and when he gave us the dictate for the WEEI app, he said, I want it to be as good as ESPN. And that was the charge. And that stuck with us because that's the kind of expansive thinking that I think is emblematic of where radio and mobile need to go. So I saw Tim there and it just kind of ticked off in my head because to me it was one of those very early on seminal moments. We're going to move to George Bundy, uh, the dude with the Google Glass. Um, and, and George, and, and, be, and indicative of the Google Glass, George is really going to take us into the future. George has been standing in the back corner for the past uh, four hours uh, watching the Apple uh, press conference. Yeah, I, I just tweeted everything, so I don't even have to speak. Just, just go okay, to my so Twitter go to your account. Twitter handle, you just see what he's going to talk about. But it's been great, because George has been pulling me aside like every 15 minutes going, oh, check this out. And here's the smartwatch and everything else. So George is really going to take us into the future, because that's what he does. He's the founder and CEO of BRS Media, which is a diverse and growing media e-commerce firm 
that helps companies build and brand on the power of the web. Uh, they pioneered the industry-specific domain space over 16 years ago with the launch of .fm and .am. Uh, today, some of the most recognizable and innovative brands in streaming and social media use FMAM top-level domains. George is an early adopter. He said to me, uh, he demoed mobile streaming at the NEB 2003 in Las Vegas with an HP Pocket PC. I'm, there it is. There it is. <laughs> and, and he predicted then, quote, within the next five years, more internet listeners would tune into their favorite online station with a wireless device than with a desktop PC. In 2003. In 2003. His timing was just a little off. But boy, he was right. George, tell us what the, you know, go so, further yeah, out. So yeah, we're going to, I mean, first to go back and, and look at this thing, because for the most part, this looks like everyone's smartphone these days. I mean, it's just amazing. There's two things that are amazing. The fact that, you know, we talked about, and we did demo a live stream to a radio station in Vegas in 2003. But I think it's also interesting the fact that this had a Windows-based operating system, and it was created by Hewlett Packard, both of which no one has in their uh, pocket today. So that's... Uh, and hopefully kind of you don't itself, own the HP stock. Uh, no, <laughs> no but, well, but at the same time, it's interesting how things evolve because, mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, that's the case. But now, really, today I wanted to talk about where we go from here, not necessarily even in the smartphone realms, but the Internet of Things. Has anyone heard that term, the Internet of Things? Uh, I mean, just Silicon Valley is going nuts over this, quite frankly. And they're literally tripping over each other, as today at the Apple announcement, about these Internet of Things, and they're everything that's interconnected. Uh, everything from, obviously, your phone, the car, this chair, these clothes, my watch. You know, everything has an interconnection to it, and many and most of those things will have some type of sound, Bluetooth or otherwise, that will engage listeners in the realm of Internet radio. So this is a really compelling advancement um, that's, that's one of the things. And one of the reasons why, although I did, you know, Jennifer said to bring the Google Glass, um, really wasn't relative till about two weeks ago or so when Pandora just happened to put an app up there and, you know, really made it more of a multimedia device than we've ever seen before. Um, and then, like I said, the, uh, the uh, smart watches are really compelling. In fact, like today, it's called Apple Watch, not iWatch. <laughs> Um, along with the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus, so there's your brands that just came out today. But um, everyone in the tech industry has been falling over themselves getting a particular type of smartwatch. Here's the, uh, <laughs> here's the, um, the Pebble. This was a Kickstarter campaign. This was one of the first smartwatches. This actually also has a Pandora app on it that plays back um, your internet radio through your phone. But this was a Kickstarter campaign. This wasn't a Fortune 5000 company. This was Samsung. You're not going to lift up your pants leg, are you? Well, yeah, actually, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's uh, I didn't know. No, no. I really didn't know. Here's, uh, here's a Fitbit. Okay. This is also <laughs> it, you know, digital enabled. But I can't listen to internet radio off this thing quite yet. But that will be coming soon. So, so yeah, I mean, the reality is it's, it's all pretty much you know, going to be interconnected in the Internet of Things. The other thing I thought was important, and again, there's so much going on that I just really had to take some notes and, and provide it here. Intel recently made an announcement a couple of weeks ago about the fact that they created the first smallest, the world's smallest 3G chip. And this chip will be you know, in your cufflinks or something else like that. And they're going to talk about that and demo that at Fashion Week, not in Silicon Valley. Hmm. Because their initiative is everything is going to be wearable. And those wearable devices will have to be, you know, usable by the end person. This thing we could talk about for days because I'm sitting in San Francisco and, you know, people are getting kicked out of bars and everything doesn't like this. But inevitably, the new patent Google has gotten for these glasses just looks like yours. The prisms inside the glass, the cameras inside the frames, it won't look anything different than the glasses we wear. The, like I said, the watch doesn't look any different to anyone else until I actually start, uh, you know, pinging it. And then everyone looks at it and says, well, that's kind of an interesting scenario. Where does, you know, how, what type of demo is that? And like a lot of Fs and Xs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, the reality is the next version that's out next month will have Bluetooth headsets that uh, 
Samsung will have with it. So there's your future. I mean, the question becomes, how are you developing for that? Good question. <laughs> and, so, where, and where's radio at? I guess that's the question we need to ask mm -hmm. because, like I said 11 years ago, with the uh, Pocket PC, this is where it's going. Right. Um, so we have to figure out, you know, how radio is going to get involved. Many of these things are going to be, you know, speaker enabled, if you will, even down to uh, the ring. Mm -hmm. So uh, take advantage of it. So I'm going to throw this out, and Scott, this is a little bit to you, and I haven't even introduced Scott. He's with, he's with Alpha. But since you opened the door, I mean, if you're at a radio station, how do you prioritize, you know, uh, smartwatches, getting into connected cars, uh, you know, all of these new options that are coming out? What happens inside of a company, Scott, is, is you all try to figure out where to put your resources? Well, we pride ourselves on being uh, innovative and looking at the, uh, at the curve on where the horizon's headed, not where it is now. Uh, that's part of it, um, to make sure that we're pacing and staying in front of what's next because uh, the Internet of Things is true. In fact, I ordered something, I forgot the name of it, at CES that is a device for 150 bucks. It'll sit in your house and it will monitor your, the temperature of your house, monitor motion for security, smoke, um, you know, detection of CO2, and I'm thinking, wow, this is going to put the alarm companies out of business. How cool is that? And I can access it from my mobile devices and um, anywhere I'm at. And so I'm really excited about the fact that there are companies entering this space to answer those questions. Uh, you know, we look for ways to um, extend our brands, but also look at it and, and think back, because history sometimes you learn a lesson from that. And radio is the original social media. So for us, we're looking for ways to put our social media on steroids and make it more interva interactive and be able to reach people and touch people and engage them in a way that we've never been able to do before. And I'm thrilled to death to see these small devices evolving and developing. Uh, we're a, a, a proponent of Clip Interactive Radio. It's, it's been a, a giant leap forward in, in the area of interactivity and being able to do and transcend just past the passive listening and ways typical broadcasters have been consumed um, on a lot of different platforms. I think the real question is, will the alarm play Kink FM when you get home? It, yes. Okay, good. That's all that matters. Um, Gotti Mazor, who is another mobile app developer like me. <laughs> um, so we, we come at this uh, the same way as well as different. He's going to focus on his view of the best scenario for radio stations, including new functionality in mobile apps, the importance of real-time stat, stats, and revenue generation. Uh, he founded and managed three startup companies in the fields of character and voice recognition, wireless communications, and mobile radio. He sat on the advisory board of BlackBerry. So, I mean, he really has a very deep quality uh, background in, in digital and mobile. Uh, uh, currently, Nobex Technologies works with over 2,000 radio stations worldwide, including the BBC, CBC, Bauer Chorus, Bell Media, and many others. Uh, and in, he's in over 60 countries and offers Nobex Radio and Nobex Partners white label platform. So what's your vision for where it's going? I actually want to touch first on what, uh, what was mentioned actually at the Clear Channel presentation in, uh, in here at the panel. I think that uh, uh, we focus a lot on talking when we talk about why a station should go mobile, we talk about monetization. And I think that uh, uh, not too many stations will actually make money from going mobile. And I know that we're shooting ourselves in the foot now, but basically monetization on mobile relatively to uh, the effort of going mobile if you go with the development of an app and maintaining an app and chasing the ever, go ever going on changes of the industry is not going to pay off uh, uh, directly through monetization in the client, at least not initially. What really is uh, a huge benefit of going mobile is actually when you say that's the first time that as a broadcaster I can have direct immediate channel to the listener. So now instead of just broad broadcasting through FM and then through some uh, uh, survey or research later know how the audience reacted, now I can see exactly what's going on. I can chat with them. I can see if they left me uh, when I played a given song. So uh, just imagine that you have a console that shows you, based on your mobile listenership, if 
uh, when you started to play the song, the listenership went up or went down. Uh, statistics, not only in terms of how many users you have and how many listening, uh, listening hours you have, but specific engagement with the content and, and with, with your stream. Uh, so I think that when you go mobile, you need to think first on the monetization for, for this to at least cover the expense, but then the, what benefit you can get out of that by this direct interaction. And that's basically what we're trying to do. I mean, we started as an aggregator, Nobix Radio, just like any other aggregators. And actually, through discussions with some of the main uh, uh, networks, uh, the first one was Clear Channel. Clear Channel doesn't allow any aggregator to play, to play their content uh, in the app. Uh, and they, and basically probably only CBS, were the only ones that had enough power to go at mobile uh, seriously uh, with, uh, with expenses, with the dedication, with, uh, with all the resources uh, and, and say, and if you want to listen to a clear channel station, you need to download iHeartRadio or you need to download radio.com for CBS. Um, and at that, those discussions that we got from, uh, uh, from CBS, some primarily from clear channel, from BBC, we basically said, we kind of shifted and, and uh, my thought was that long term we cannot build a business uh, of a mobile application around someone else's content. Uh, it, uh, I see why a station would want their content to, to, content to be wi as widely distributed as possible, but in the long term, a station that allows an aggregator, and again, shooting my, ne uh, my second leg now, but a station that allows its content to be uh, uh, broadcast or available on an aggregator uh, uh, product, loses the brand of the station. I mean, the, 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 the client, the customer now listens not to the given station, he listens to TuneIn or Nobex or VTuner or one of the other aggregators. And I don't know of any station that the DJ allow himself during the, after the song to say, if you like this song, you might want to switch to another station because they play similar music. And that's what aggregator products do. Okay, because that's the product definition. We want to keep the customers. And we shifted at Nobex to say, we want to build solutions that are basically the brand of the station and the station business is at the heart of, of the business. And we then went to the network. So we, as you mentioned, we have BBC, CBC, Bauer, uh, Coase. I mean, all the major networks, or so 75% of the major networks in Canada, UK as customers. And what we did n nine months ago, we opened that to the long tail of the stations. So a single station can come to our site, Nobex Partners, and basically within something that takes about four or five minutes, come up, have native, I would say, if I may say so myself, I mean, really state-of-the-art native clients for iPhone, BlackBerry, Android, and Windows Phone that cost them nothing. Uh, it's free apps with revenue share or an advertising mechanism within that, but the whole app, the whole product definition of the app is such that puts the station and what the station gets out of the app in the center of the app. Uh, so again, all the back-end portal and console for the DJ to see exactly immediate activities. The branding is the station branding and it's under the, uh, the station brand. So, and that's, that's, that's and again, uh, it's still early, but I think that down the road, the station needs to own the brand and needs to own the, the listener when he listens to the station, and that's a way to do that. That's an amazing rain moment. <laughs> you know, the, but I think it's also indicative of how mobile is changing. You know, and uh, as developers, as providers, as whatever, mm -hmm. you know, standing pad is just not an option. And you have to critically look at what you're doing and reassess it. And I mean, you reinvented your business. Uh, and, and did literally a 180, which, which is really amazing. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Scott. You know, I, I threw him a question a minute ago you know, before introducing him. Now it's his turn. Uh, Scott is uh, a, a programming uh, legend. He's been involved in the content side of our business for a long time, very successfully. And he's going to talk about the mobile vision uh, from the company station perspective. Uh, there, there are new revenue providers out there like Zap Media, like Clip Interactive. Uh, Alf is very involved with Clip, um, and, and I know Scott's going to talk about that. Uh, for the past 22 years, Scott has been a leader. He's the EVP of programming at Alpha, a company that's been in the news a lot lately for their growth and their approach to local radio. 
Scott oversees all the formats, market research, community relationships, digital, and he's been a real central figure in, in the growth and success uh, of a company that I know a lot of us have read a lot about over the, over the past year or two, and they're doing some really exciting things. So, Scott, what are you seeing uh, from the local station perspective? Well, the challenge is to keep up where the audience is going. Um, most of us know that, you know, as individuals, we only, only have so many time, uh, so much time in a day to consume whatever we're doing, whether it's uh, all things internet, um, it's, it's, it's digital, it's uh, your mobile device, your, your desktop, your laptop. Your eyes and ears only have so much time. So we're now competing with ways to become uh, the most engaging and interesting uh, uh, piece of information available, and it takes a village to make that happen. Um, you know, we're very proud to be uh, have Clip uh, alongside of us. In fact, the founder uh, started the company on a very simple premise. He was in Denver, Colorado, with his daughter, listening to a radio ad. Concert spot comes on, and she goes, "Daddy, how do we? Can't we just buy tickets to the show?" And he he thought a minute for a minute. Hmm. Why can't we just push a button and buy tickets for a show? And thanks to Clip, you can now do that and beyond. And it does take a village. Uh, you need a lot of vendors. You need a lot of thinking to keep ahead of where it's all going. But we, we sit back and we look at how do we become the most important, interesting piece of, of entertainment that somebody can consume. That's really our challenge. Um, then the rest of it's easy because we just need to keep up with where all the all the technology is headed, but we're a content company. We're a local content company um, with some national tentacles, but, but we, do, we do have to, uh, to win the minds and ears and eyes and hearts of our local audiences. And so our real focus is, is, is putting out that best content and engaging in deeper levels. And, and so we're, we're competing for, for the uh, minds and ears, eyes, attention. That's really what our, our challenge is. And uh, so these are ways to gain more access to that, to spend more time with it. In the next uh, couple of years, most of you know, or a couple of years, most of you know, um, you know, mobile devices will surpass how we're consuming digital media on everything, including uh, the dash, mobile dashboard in the car and in fixed positions and in your laptops and your desktops. And so we want to get ahead of that and be there um, and, and still uh, provide that level that we have now. Otherwise, we're going to be swallowed up and, and um, maybe we won't be here. Do you, you know, I brought up metrics uh, when I was talking earlier and just, you know, being able to monetize. Do you, you know, as somebody who's very involved in the content success of your company, do you worry about uh, not being able to capitalize from a ratings perspective, from a, a real numeric growth perspective uh, by promoting mobile the way you do? Or are you comfortable with it? Well, we're comfortable in that we, we find ways to use those devices to create additional occasions of listening. Um, and we do it through a number of, uh, uh, tactically, we do it uh, commercially with our advertisers. Um, and we try to figure out how to do that in a way that is consumable and um, makes sense for consumers and is, um, uh, you know, absorbed in a way that isn't intrusive. And that's kind of the next generation of where I think our medium is going. I think the traditional audio ads, the 30s, 60s, and so on, are going away. Um, if, I can, uh, if I can entertain you and keep you engaged in my content along the way, maybe provide you with some information you need to know, a lot of times people discount information. Information is important sometimes as the hit as a song. Uh, it's, it's how you present it. Um, and I think the Super Bowl is a great example of, of tremendous creative. And if we could do that with, with our audio medium and with uh, the digital platforms that are, are extending it, I mean, I think right now 68% of everybody in America consumes some form of this on their mobile device, and the, and the curve is like this. And um, if we don't, uh, if we don't become, embrace it and become part of it, um, we can't just sit, stick our head in the sand or we're going to be uh, left behind. Well, I thought in Kurt's state of the industry, outside of the uh, Spock references, um, there, was, there was that one slide that he's predicting um, uh, online slash mobile is going to surpass AM FM listening in eight years. So, yeah, it's here. We've been able to experiment with some interesting campaigns that 
uh, quite honestly, are new in our space. And uh, thanks to Clip Interactive, we've been able to do it with advertisers and, uh, and, and have real solid measurement statistics on how, how well it works. And we can fine tune and see, uh, based on the campaigns, how engaging it is or isn't. Uh, to your point earlier, you know, are people, are, is there more usage or less usage? And we can, we can see it almost in real time. It's been absolutely fascinating. We've been able to bring some advertisers back uh, that have left radio, some advertisers that are in the video medium, show them solid uh, results with, with the kind of metrics they want to see that shows, my gosh, I can actually see a return on my investment. And radio, and, and they don't even, you know, they don't even realize they're using the radio medium. We're doing it in an entertaining, promotional way. It's just been absolutely fantastic. Wow, they just shaved off like three minutes off the clock. Uh, so let's go to Jim Cott. Uh, Jim, you're the... <laughs> no, Jim, sorry about that. Jim. Oh, I hope you had coffee. No, um, Jim's a leading provider of technology and streaming services. He is uh, the senior director of project product management at Abacast, which was recently uh, acquired by w Wide Orbit. He, he is really well positioned to talk about uh, what is happening with features and functionality and usage, as well as revenue paths uh, that Abacast has identified. Jim's been at Abacast for six years as their product manager for their radio industry products. He's, you know, I've done a bunch of panels with Jim. He clearly knows his stuff. So, Jim, how is it going from your perspective? <clears throat> well, I wanted to start out by saying it's great to be here in Denver. So, yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting 20 minutes to say that. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I just, um, so Abacast, we stream about uh, close to 2,000 uh, radio stations, primarily in the U.S. Just this month, or just in August, uh, our mobile traffic went over 50%, and uh, about 12 months ago, it was 28%. So just underscores the importance of, of mobile and, and, uh, and how it's growing. Um, I also wanted to say that, uh, your, George, your, uh, your device from 10 years ago with a Microsoft operating system in it, with nobody really, not many people having a, a mobile device with a Microsoft operating system anymore, a couple weeks ago, they're, they announced they're rejiggering their strategy and their positioning and messaging was that uh, they're optimizing everything for what they said uh, their term was a cloud-based mobile first world. And I think the term mobile first is, is how we should all be thinking about this, right? I mean, we've got them on our, on our person 24 hours a day. So um, uh, I was going to say that also mobile um, is really a, a, a nice platform for audio, in my opinion. Um, if you compare the audio ad unit to, let's say, uh, a video ad unit, video ad unit is very is highly effective, but it requires a one-to-one -one engagement, and um, audio, of course, can be consumed uh, passively, right? Um, and so uh, you're doing lots of things while you're with your mobile device. So I think that's really nice. If you compare audio ads with display ads, uh, it's really easy to ignore display ads, especially on a small device with not a lot of real estate. And it's much harder to ignore, uh, obviously, an audio ad. So I think mobile is, is positioned right in a, a nice sweet spot for audio uh, content and, and ad units. So what we're seeing uh, interest-wise with, with mobile is, is um, more and more geo-targeting or, or targeting in general. So. I was talking to one of our ad sales partners, and they brought up a, a campaign that they had seen, which was a uh, uh, somebody basically geofencing or geotargeting to all um, college and professional sporting events uh, or, or football games, I should say, where the stadiums are. And their product had to do with tailgating, and so they're really being very precise on on using geotargeting to reach that sort of crowd. Now that doesn't happen very often, but it will more and more, especially as things scale up. Uh, on the local level, I think if you can, as a as a um, you know local AE sell into a local advertiser, just being able to tell them that you can target uh, to the a DMA or even a zip code is a very nice message for a lot of um, any advertiser. If, if they know that, you know, even if, they're, even if your, um, your broadcast signal was going to reach 90% or 80% of their uh, target customers, to be able to say, oh, I'm going to limit it to only those zip codes or only that DMA, everybody wants to know that their money is being well spent. Uh, 
right? So uh, we are also seeing more, much, much more interest in behavioral targeting. Most broadcasters, uh, behavioral targeting is where you um, can use uh, data providers or data partners, I should say, to deduce the likely demographic properties of the uh, of the audience person, the audience member. So, um, uh, uh, um, where, where that fits in with mobile, I think, is where um, not only the interest in uh, targeting by demographic properties, because most broadcasters don't collect the voluntary registration information. But now you've got the ability, or these partners are uh, emerging capability anyway, to say, um, well, one of the challenges of mobile, I should say, is that the, the identifier is different than the desktop, right? And so you've got two different spaces, so to speak, but you've got the ability now for data partners to say, okay, this person on this mobile device is likely the same person uh, on this desktop device, and so then you can target on demographic properties uh, around there. So, you talk about geolocation. Uh, yep. Our our number one fastest downloaded app that was non radio was a medical marijuana finder app <laughs> that was one big map. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you t you talk about targeting. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that. Um, I think another thing that I'm seeing more and more, especially mobile app developers, do is uh, is make it very easy to capture user-generated content because it's with uh, it's with it's with everybody, uh, and um, broadcasters, radio broadcasters have local. Of course, they have local talent and they have local events and concerts that they promote and things like that. Uh, it's very, you can make it very easy to capture video and, uh, and audio clips and then, you know, submit them for contests or use them online. And so I'm seeing more and more of that out there. Hey, George? Well, I, no, I, th I think that's interesting because not only on the flip side of things, everything I have on now can take a video or a picture. In fact, the Google Glass can broadcast live. I took a picture earlier today. The watch has video as well as audio. So the fact is, as you broadcasters, you content providers, these Internet of Things are going to be just as compelling to get your word out as they are for the listeners to listen to you. So we have uh, 78 seconds. Um, <laughs> 74. Um, really quick. I'm going to leave you with just one final question. You each have like five seconds to answer. Is there one feature on a non-radio app that you wish you could see in a radio app? Marijuana locator. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that would be for kink, right? All oh, brands. All brands. Anybody? Yeah, Deborah. Some, I can't top some that. Some dimension of uh, personalization, because I think we're a personal medium, and personalization is the whole key to this. It's a personal device. Great. Jim? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I, can't top, I can't top the marijuana. No, that, no, would be, that would be a good one. Basically, being able to, um, I don't know, uh, have features that are very popular, but most people don't think that they're popular, that sort of thing. Okay. Gotti? Chat with, uh, between the station and listeners. I think that's a key uh, on, on radio apps. George? A Lady Gaga finder. <laughs> when you play her song, let's figure out where she is and go from there. And on that happy note, uh, thank you all very much, and thanks to everybody at Rain for this.